Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 18. And today we'll be continuing our conversation about how we can kind of start thinking more about the physical constraints when we're doing our designs. Um, particularly we're talking a little bit about both power as well as design space exploration. So uh, let's talk a little bit about both of those, right? So uh, to kind of summarize that, yes. So we're talking about power and how that kind of impacts what we can do as designers. And uh, you know, we've been talking about making these parameterized generators, well, those parameters, we need to figure out how to set them, right? So in order to do that, we need to do a little DSC. Okay, so, I'm sorry, is there is there a question? Okay, uh, great. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start talking off uh, about power. So, uh, you know, as you can see here, why is power matter? Well, it's often actually the, the biggest constraint for design. Uh, it's kind of surprising, right? You might think, oh, well, isn't performance or, you know, uh, chip area or something. Those all matter. But um, when it comes down to it, even if you had, you know, a super big chip or, you know, you had different performance targets, uh, power doesn't come back and get you, right? So uh, it's really kind of become, uh, like I said, the, mo the most important design constraint often in the modern era, right? So uh, why does that matter? Well, it kind of matters in multiple dimensions. So on the one hand, uh, power over time requires energy, right? So energy is power times time. Uh, and so, um, so in other words, saying is why is power matter? Well, it's because energy matters. And why is energy matters? Well, uh, if you have a mobile device, which uh, a lot of time working on, it seems like more and more things we deal with these days are battery powered rather than plugged into a wall. Um, how much energy it consumes to accomplish it, the task you want is going to impact uh, the needs of the battery, right? So uh, if you have a fixed size device, right, if you can change energy consumption, it's going to affect the battery life, right? If you, you know, make your processor more efficient, you can get away with a smaller, uh, you can sorry, you can have a longer battery life, which is great. Or perhaps you say, you know what, this is kind of the battery life, which is necessary, right? For example, for a smartphone, you know, most designs are kind of predicated around, you know, what is reasonable use uh, and then making sure there's enough battery life to last for a day at that reasonable use rate. Um, that's, for example, kind of, you know, a, a common goal. Then that kind of sets a certain uh, size and weight constraint. So you kind of need to have a battery, you know, so big in order to handle that. And if your battery is that big, you know, it has a certain amount of weight and size, right? So if you can reduce the amount of energy you need, right, you can either have longer battery life or a smaller device, either of which would be great. Uh, additionally, uh, energy costs money, right? Uh, you know, so perhaps, you know, in our homes, we aren't super worried about our smartphones charging in terms of impacting overall power bill, but it still adds up, right? Especially for someone on the other end, like a data center operator, uh, for running a large internet scale service, right? Power is a large cost for them, right? So if they can reduce their, their, their energy bill, they'll get some savings, right? Um, and, you know, this plays other places too as well, right? I mean, there's a lot discussed recently about, you know, the pending, uh, you know, environmental catastrophe caused by excessive cryptocurrency mining, right? And all the energy that requires and all the carbon produced to produce that energy, right? Similar, right? If we can reduce energy, it matters, right? And for that reason, actually, a lot of these, you know, crypto mining operations are put in places where they can get access to cheap uh, power because otherwise it wouldn't make sense financially. Um, so yeah, so that really does matter. And sometimes you may hear me slip up where I may say power versus energy in different contexts. But it's important in mind to kind of remember what they each mean, right? Power is the instantaneous, you know, rate of energy consumption. Energy is, you know, that power over time. Um, continuing on, uh, you know, in a device, uh, when power is consumed, you know, we think of that as, you know, being, you know, a way to get the computation we want done. But it is going to produce uh, heat, right? Um, and, you know, as long as it's within reasonable limits, that's fine. But uh, if it gets too hot, bad things can happen, right? Uh, it can damage the product, right? It can damage the part, you know, if it gets too hot. Uh, or it can be too hot to hold, right? So for example, going back to the smartphone example, um, even though, you know, maybe there's that moment where you really want to have that smartphone, uh, you know, move a really big file or do something really intensive, and even though the processor is more than capable of performing the operation, if you allow it to go at that, you know, peak amount for too long, the handset actually can get too hot to hold, right? And that's not good, right? You don't want to get sued. Uh, or hurt people. <laughs> and so um, we can be conscious of that, you know, what is the peak power? And maybe though it might be instantaneous peak, it might be quite high, but uh, that could be okay for some amount of thermal capacity, right? So 
uh, you know, in your device would be the chip, the packaging, the cooling infrastructure, right? If you put a sharp spike of power of heat into it and then decrease, it's going to increase it a little bit, but it's going to be okay, right? It's more sustained, you know, throughputs, right? So adding some amount of thermal capacity can help. Uh, there's actually some really interesting research coming out this summer about looking into using phase changing materials in a data center uh, in order to take advantage of those phase changes that kind of add some more thermal capacitance to their cooling infrastructure, right? And so um, there's definitely some stuff there, right? But so for terms for us as designer, right, we need to be conscious of that, yeah, we really want to keep power in check, right? Because otherwise there's a lot of cost constraints cause of cooling. Uh, and guess what? If it's going to get too hot, um, what do you do? Well, you need to put more and more cooling in there, right? Realize, of course, even if you don't think you're putting any cooling infrastructure, you just have a chip on a board, technically that's, you know, passively air-cooled, right? There's just the air flowing by in your room, um, and you hope that maybe that slow takes the heat away, right? Uh, but, you know, perhaps you put a heat sink on there or a fan or even liquid cooling, do more intensive cooling operations. But in spite of that, you know, you may recognize the temperature is getting too hot in your device, in which case you need to throttle it. That is to decrease the amount of power it's consuming in order to keep that heat in check, right? And we've all kind of experienced that. We've all, you know, seen your laptops be assigned to something big and then we hear the fan spin up and then the perceived performance slows. That's the throttling, right? So we'll talk about throttling in terms of what it means for frequency in a few minutes, but in terms of why it matters for power, right? Once again, right? If you, uh, even if you spike momentarily too high, that might be okay, but maybe it just kind of throttle. And so all this kind of goes back to the story of when we design things, we need to be in mind of both how much, how energy efficient we are and how much we're able to get our goal application done for how much energy, as well as, you know, these power constraints, right? And so, um, as you see on the slide, there's additional things to be aware of, right? For example, your peak power draw uh, will determine what you need from the power supply, right? So your power supply, whether it be in a mobile device or even plugged into the wall, right? There's gonna be a certain capacity has to you know, produce a certain amount of instantaneous power. And even if you aren't using that amount of instantaneous power, it kind of needs to uh, be able to kind of handle the worst case. This is another one of these examples of, you know, provisioning for the worst case, but you'd rather provision for the average case, right? So remember we talked about that with bandwidth on Monday, where we we're saying where, you know, you build enough bandwidth for the peak case, but you, you would rather have the peak and average be pretty close. Same is true for power demand, right? If you have to build a power supply system for very high peak power relative to your average power, that's just wasted cost, right? If you can make that peak power much closer to your average power, you can have a much smaller, cheaper, and perhaps even more efficient uh, power supply. Um, so that will, that will matter, right? Um, and then of course, you know, average power kind of sets your overall energy consumption. So that's gonna matter. So, Hopefully all this combined, you know, you're probably thinking, oh man, I should really be thinking about energy in my design. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about what we can do, but first maybe I'll pause if there's any questions so far. Okay, well, let's continue then. So, um, what can I do as a designer? Well, there's multiple levels of design, right? You know, there's a kind of architect level design the entire system. And then even as a low, uh, working down within a component in some block somewhere as a designer, you know, we may also have our ability to impact it, right? So uh, to first order, uh, you can approximate the amount of power consumed or the power demand uh, as this equation on the right. And the reason why I bothered to write this equation is we can see that we can actually talk about each of these terms mean and our ability to impact each of these terms. And from there, we kind of can have an impact. So, um, uh, for example, uh, oh, sorry, before I go, Alan, I want to explain why the slide mentions dynamic power, right? So uh, if you think of power consumption in the system, you can kind of roughly taxonomize in two categories, your static power and your dynamic power. And uh, so your static power is kind of things that in some ways, I want to say you don't have any control over, but they're kind of continuous and uh, going on in the background. Um, so these are things like leakage current at the you know very small circuit scale, but even larger, kind of thinking more holistically, you might think of it as you know just things you need to have always on. For example, maybe I have this big system and I can turn parts of it on or off. But I need to have some sort of base control controller always on. That's the thing that can contribute to your static power. But at the circuit level, static power refers to things typically like uh, leakage and other types of things like that. But at a circuit level, talking about dynamic power is what we're talking about right now, which is, okay, so there's these four terms, right? So 
the alpha is the uh, activity factor. And that's how much things are toggling, right? So if you actually were to take your complicated digital design and think of it as a circuit, really what you're doing is you are charging and discharging capacitances, right? And how much power it's going to take depends on, you know, how much, uh, how much capacitance you're charging, discharging. Uh, the rate at which you're doing that, that's going to be the frequency, um, as well as the voltage which you're charging. As you can see, there's actually a V squared relation there. Uh, and then this alpha, this activity factor, is how often you're doing it, right? So maybe first imagine that's just one. You're always doing it. Um, right, okay, so yeah, so I have some capacitance. You know, I need to charge up, and then I'm doing that at some frequency at some rate. So obviously, if I'm charging and discharging it more times per second, that's going to require more power. Okay. And then, uh, you know, more capacitance is going to require, you know, more power to charge a larger amount of capacitance. The V squared is, you know, how much you potential we're putting into it, right? And so if you do solve this out, the circuit's not going to do it today, uh, you can derive as a V squared term in there. Let's talk about now this activity factor term, right? So this activity factor term is um, how often we're doing this, right? So it turns out that, you know, uh, if you look at a hardware design and you look at all of your signals, you even see that in your, in your waveforms, most of the time, a lot of stuff actually is not changing in value, right? Um, so if you define activity factor as, you know, times uh, a given signal changes per cycle. So if it's like a counter and it's counting up once per cycle, uh, that would be an activity factor of one, right? Because you can see it's counting up. Now, uh, a lot of things won't change every cycle, right? There's some input or something that maybe changes less often. Uh, additionally, realize even in something like a counter, the least significant bit, you know, that last bit is going to toggle every cycle, right? It's going to be zero, one cycle, one, the next cycle, zero, one cycle, one, the next cycle. But then the next bit over is only going to change every other cycle, right? Uh, it's going to be, you know, zero, zero, then one, one, then zero, zero, then one, one. So that's actually going to have an activity factor of 0 0.5. And then, you know, what well, the next bit, it's going to be half of that, you know, or one eighth, one of eight cycles is going to change. And so you can see, even though I said the entire counter is an activity factor of one, in terms of looking at the entire register as a thing all at once, at a per bit granularity, uh, you can see how it's actually perhaps not changing too much. And that's kind of the case for a lot of things within design. If you go crawling around, you're going to find that much of the time, many signals don't change, right? And so the question is, well, how often do they change? And so we kind of capture that with this kind of catch-all term of activity factor. Um, and so we'll, we'll see in a second, that's also something, we just, that's an opportunity for something we can work on as a designer, right? So even without us doing a deliberate intervention, just us designing our design, you know, it's going to turn out in practice that some signals are not going to change every cycle. So that activity factor is going to be less than one. And that's going to kind of scale this back, right? We aren't necessarily charging um, every capacitance, every clock cycle, right? That's the kind of activity factor that's kind of capturing that, um, that concept. So I'm going to pause here for any questions on the... CVS squared equation before I move on to the next portion. Okay, well then, um, so given this kind of power equation, which is you know something you know architects or designers should kind of have you know in their mind, uh, how can we go ahead and attack these factors? Well, there's a few ways, right? So uh, for that first one, activity, like I said. Even without us trying, that's going to be less than one. But we can definitely still push that number down further, right? Um, so, hey, guess what? We can recognize some things uh, are idle, and we can put them to sleep and make sure they don't toggle at all. Even though, you know, we say idle in the sense I'm not trying to do anything with it, but perhaps even I'm not trying to do anything with this component, um, it may still be, you know, operating or changing or whatever. You know what? Instead, we say, hey, you know what? We know for sure we own this entire component or entire block. Let's put it to sleep and then make sure the activity factor is zero, right? Um, let's do that. Uh, so that's, that's definitely one thing we can do. From the, uh, interestingly, as a designer, we kind of talked a little bit about areas, kind of this cost constraint. It also comes back to power, right? So, you know, to first order, you can see that, you know, uh, areas can kind of directly impact power, right? So let's talk a little bit about, I guess maybe we should back up and talk about area versus capacitance, right? So for a given amount of area, uh, there's a certain amount of capacitance, right, from all those transistors and wires within there. Uh, what's interesting is over time, with a lot of, you know, hand-waving, uh, as you 
go forward in Moore's Law, and going down smaller and smaller transistors, uh, the capacitance per unit area is roughly constant, some squinting, right? Uh, so let's talk about what's going on, right? So, you know, originally you have some number of transistors in some amount of area. Each of those transistors and wires has some amount of capacitance. If you shrink those transistors and wires, they're, of course, going to have um, less capacitance. But also because they're shrunk, they will take less area, right? Um, and so, yeah, so as you shrink in Moore's Law, yes, you will be reducing capacitance for the same amount of design. However, if you have your area constant and you're applying Moore's Law, that is, you're shrinking transistors but keeping the same amount of area, that means you're actually getting more transistors, right? So if you have more transistors, you know, um, fortunately, your overall uh, capacitance actually is going to be roughly constant because even though you have more of them, their capacitance per transistor has gone down. So to first order, you think kind of capacitance is proportional to area. And thus, as a designer, if I want to reduce capacitance, I want to reduce my area. And so even, uh, you know, depending on what technology I'm on, that may still change, but the idea is that you want to reduce my area. So, you know, thinking about where can I reuse components or even figure out components I don't need or find ways to more efficiently compute things, right? There's the, you know, obvious low hanging fruit about, hey, if I'm, you know, anding something with one, you know, do I really need that AND gate? No, I don't, right? Stuff like that at the logic level, usually CAD tools can kind of figure out on their own. But, you know, equivalently, uh, no brainer kind of optimizations may be the chance for you to come in as a human uh, and try and figure out how to squeeze your design. In particular, maybe figuring out ways to, you know, multiplex that is to reuse something from multiple different places may be worthwhile. Um, and so, yeah, so you make your area smaller, you can reduce your capacitance, and that's less capacitance to charge and discharge. Um, and then uh, there's the frequency and voltage, and I kind of let them together. And the reason why, as we'll see in the next slide, is they, 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 they work in tandem, right? So, uh, yes, if I can reduce V and F, uh, that will uh, definitely save a lot of power. Uh, and it kind of depends on how things work out, if that's possible, depends on what performance target is, and how many cycles I need to, you know, get things done. As a designer, my opportunity to fix that is a critical path, right? So if I can get a nice, short, critical path, um, that's going to help us out, right? It's going to allow us to not only run at a really high clock rate if we want to go really fast, but also it's going to allow us to save power if we want to run slow. And so we'll cover that in the next slide, but still kind of just big picture stuff so far. Okay. So let's kind of talk about these terms, right? So uh, as I kind of said, to reduce the activity factor, you want to uh, turn things off, right? Uh, so there's two forms of doing this. There's power gating and clock gating, right? So power gating is, you know, really not just turning off the lights, but turning off the power, you know, turning off the breaker for a house, so to speak, right? You know, you're really just cutting the power off altogether, right? So you entire off power for the entire portion of the design. Um, you would save a lot of power that way, obviously, because it's kind of like you turn it off. So you think of it as almost like not so much reducing the activity factor, it's more of almost reducing uh, the capacitance term in that prior equation, right? You've literally just kind of taken that out of the equation, right? That portion. Um, now, uh, for efficient design, you may find ways to um, uh, do this, right? This is usually done kind of at a pretty big level and kind of a pre-planned thing. So for us doing our super nimble little uh, generators, usually just kind of working at a level beyond us. Um, but it's still be kind of worthwhile to be aware of this thing. Part of why this comes up is even if, you know, um, we aren't designing components doing the power gating. If we're part of a component's power gating, we need to be able to turn ourselves back on with our latency and process for kind of recovering from a, a, a power on incident, right? So when we're designing our component, thinking about, you know, what does it mean to come out of reset and how to do that quickly so it's easier for someone else to include you in a component that gets power gated. It's kind of an example. Um, then moving on to uh, clock gating, right? So Interestingly, uh, the clock is almost like uh, an adversary when it comes to power consumption, right? So we use the clock to synchronize our state elements, but when it comes to power consumption, you know, it, it goes from one to zero uh, every cycle, right? So it's got that really high activity factor, right? It's constantly changing. Um, and so uh, realize that there's the power dissipated by charging and discharging the, you know, that clock network, delivering the clock signal to all of your uh, registers. And it's also, uh, you know, the capacitance of that actually at the registers it's controlling, right? Or, you know, being used to... Con and so, if it turns out that we really want to, uh, we really don't need a certain portion of our design, 
we can turn off the claw to that portion of the design. So what we're saying is we are going to um, uh, cut off the clock and stop it from switching so much, uh, switching. And thus, we're not going to be charging. This charging is just going to be staying at the same level. And so that, that portion of the design is uh, you know, no longer functional, um, but we're saving power on it. So uh, let's talk a little about what this means kind of in some context, right? So um, you may wonder, what's the difference between clock gating and power gating? Well, it's which one we're, we're, we're turning on or off, right? So power gating is turning off the voltage supply. Clock gating is turning off the clock, right? Um, so when you turn off the voltage supply, yeah, you're also going to turn off the clock that portion of the chip too. So power gating is kind of like both, but usually implemented with just the power level. Um, so why why do clock gating then if you're not able to do power gating? Uh, you can usually do clock gating at a much finer grain layers much more easily, right? So in order to do power gating, you need to kind of control your voltage supplies and have things come out of reset versus, and so it's often destructive, you know, for the contents of the registers versus clock gating is non-destructive, right? It's going to hold the contents of the registers. They aren't going to lose their value. They just aren't able to change while it's clock gated. So you can do it at a much smaller time granularities. So you don't have to worry about losing the state. And much also smaller granularities in terms of space, right, as well. Um, this is why it's a pretty common thing. And so what's actually neat about clock gating is now in 2021, this is a pretty standard optimization that CAD tools can do for us, right? They recognize, oh, wait, I can clock gate these registers and I'll do that for you. I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, but there's a really important key caveat. And that is, like a lot of other organizations for these tools, this is why you want to kind of think about what the tools are doing and make sure you allow them to do their great optimizations for you. Uh, it can't change the observable semantic behavior, right? So if it goes in and decides to turn off the clock to register on you, that's going to change your observable behavior. It's also now this register doesn't work anymore, right? So it's not going to do that, right? So when could it do that? Well, if you're working with registers that have a write enable, that is, you know, the register only updates its value on the clock edge when the write enables one and does not do it when the write enables zero, um, now you give the semantic leeway for that catch to make optimization automatically, right? Because if the write enable is zero, this register can't change value, right? So one way of implementing can't change value <laughs> is to turn off the clock <laughs> in order to get the clock, right? And so that's, that's what's going on, right? So basically, uh, you kind of need a little bit of semantic change what you're designing in order to let the tools kind of do the optimization for you. And so for you as a designer, practically, it's not too complicated, right? Just, you know, consider using uh, a, a register for write enable, right? And you've probably already done that. Yeah, there may be in some scenarios in your design where, um, you know, for semantic reasons, you want to make sure the register you did not change certain cycles. You may have used the right enable, or perhaps you use the right enable kind of implicitly with a mux or even, you know, a one statement, for example. Um, it's worth uh, sometimes taking the time to actually refactor your design to make sure it actually uses a right enable properly, uh, nor allowed to do clock gating. So one of these things where it's kind of like, look at your design, both in terms of what you're writing in Chisel, what the Varela is getting produced sometimes, and then look at the output, how the cat tools are handling it. And you can see, you know what, made a way we're right now, it's able to recognize this is a write enable scenario and it's able to clock gate. Um, if it's not clock gating, you know what, you should ask yourself, you know, okay, well, why? And then, you know, one reason might be that, you know, you didn't turn that feature on, maybe another command line flag turn on for your cat tool. Uh, but another reason could be perhaps the way you've expressed the write enable may not be correct, right? So. Um, the reg enable, like actually declaring it from the beginning, this is a enable type, you know, a register. That's one good way of doing it in Chisel. Uh, sometimes some tools, depending on how you do, so if you do like implicitly by yourself using a mux or, you know, the one statements, sometimes it'll kind of do it automatically, but sometimes you kind of get to nudge it with somebody using reg enable. Um, another detail about clock gating, this is most beneficial for big registers, right? So we're talking about a single bit flop. You know, by the time you've added extra gates for the condition, when you turn it on or off, it may not be worth it, right? But if you have like a 3264 register, Right, that's a lot of bits to amortize this optimization for, right? Because each of those bits is going to require, you know, its own, you know, input from the clock, right? And so, um, having that all put, you know, having that, you know, amortized across the entire wide register really helps. And better yet, if you have multiple registers that use the same conditions for when they're enabled or disabled, that's more amortization for the cat tools. It's even better for them. Um, so that, that's that's great. Um, okay, so it's kind of a, a brief high level thing for power gating clock and this is power gating uh, as a designer working kind of just chisel generator level this is something we're typically going to do if you want to actually do the actual power gating you're probably going to instantiate some complicated things with your process um sorry technology you're implementing this with you might wrap those up in a black box for example but 
Uh, for us as designers, what we're probably most going to be concerned in this process is making sure our component is able to be turned off and restarted quickly. Um, you know, for clock gating, like I said, us to kind of handle this, we're going to um, uh, make sure you know we use these write enables so we can kind of do just automatic uh, clock gating by the tools. Whew. Okay, uh, questions on this? Okay, let's continue then. Um, so, so far we kind of were talking, go back to our uh, equation, right? We were talking mostly about um, these first two terms, right? You know, uh, if we can um, turn off the clock, we're kind of reducing the activity factor for state elements, um, or, and then, you know, if it cuts the power, we're kind of killing the, uh, you know, capacitance by, you know, taking off the entire portion of the design effectively out of this equation. But now we're talking about the voltage and frequency, right? The other kind of two terms, right? So, um, turns out that voltage and frequency are related, right? Uh, in particular, uh, if you uh, increase voltage, circuits go faster to a, you know, a certain amount. If you decrease voltage, they go slower to a certain amount, right? Um, that, that's a nonlinear curve, which I'm sorry, does not figure for here, but um, so in the back of your mind, you're kind of thinking, okay, higher voltage is faster, lower voltage is slower. Uh, lower voltage is less power, lower uh, frequency, is less power, right? So uh, what you're going to do is for a given um, frequency, or sorry, sorry, for a given uh, you know, target, you can kind of adjust these, right? So um, the frequency is something we set by the clock, right? And uh, you know, as I said before, the clock period needs to be greater than or equal to the delay of your critical path. Now, the delay of your circuit is going to be set by you know, the fundamental topology once in there as well as what voltage is operating at. So even after you've done your, you know, micro -touch optimizations, changing your logic depth and moving your hardware around, you still have this knob of the voltage to change um, its delay. And so uh, very often you may find yourself in a situation where you need to reach a certain performance target. So that's gonna tell you what your clock period needs to be. And, um, then you want to, you know, get your circuit delay to be just under that, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, perhaps, you know, usually your core is too slow, so you have to kind of, you know, optimize your design, you barely get underneath it. But maybe in a mobile scenario, right, you may find that actually, you know, your design, if you optimize it for really minimizing that critical path, you have a fair amount of leeway between your circuit's delay and what's actually allowable by that clock period. So what you can do is then you can actually turn down the voltage to save that, uh, it's gonna slow the circuit down, but it's also gonna save you a lot of power and you'll still be okay, right? So instead of thinking of your, um, and so that's maybe worth kind of rephrasing how you think about your design, right? You think about, okay, my design has a certain critical path delay, maybe in nanoseconds or picoseconds, whatever you're thinking those units, realize that's for a given voltage, right? So even when you use your static timing analysis, right, that's the behavior of those gates at certain operating conditions. Those operating conditions include voltages. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of why that F04 unit is nice is because this is going to automatically be calibrated relative to this, right? So for example, if I, uh, you know, change the voltage of my, uh, design, I'm going to change this delay, right? So the, in terms of nanoseconds or picoseconds, right, that's going to be a different number. However, in terms of the topology, it's the same topology, right? And, uh, if you do the F04 units, right? Uh, you're comparing your design at this different voltage to that inverter chain also at the different voltage, right? So as a result, the FO4 shouldn't change as you change your voltage, right? Um, so that's actually really helpful, right? So that's, that's why I suppose FO4 is so helpful. It's kind of thinking about what's kind of your fundamental, you know, intrinsic delay to this thing you designed. And then um, you can kind of set the voltage to actually set the real world delay, right? Um, and so within a large design, uh, you know, obviously the voltage is completely arbitrary. And as I said, there's the operating regimes for the transistors you're using. And also, of course, you know, every voltage you have on your design requires, uh, you know, uh, its own power supply, right? Uh, so its own, you know, voltage regulators and such to actually set the right voltage. And so you can have multiple of these. You definitely can have multiple voltages on a chip, but you don't want to have too many discrete voltages. You don't want to have, you know, 10,000 different voltages on a chip. To have much more manageable, fewer number. <laughs> And so you're often going to have multiple components kind of operating the same voltage to kind of reduce number of voltage domains on chip. But uh, that's kind of how level what's going on. So for what you can think about, right, is in order to think about this, 
this is this knob you have, right? You can turn this voltage, right? So more often than not, you actually can turn the voltage down to save uh, power and, and energy. And so turning the voltage down is clearly going to save power, right? But what's interesting is it's a little bit hard to see from the information given you about showing the trade-off curve between delay and voltage. Um, because in that prior equation, voltage was squared, it's possible to um, reduce your voltage, which is going to make your circuits slower. However, it reduces the power by more it reduces the performance, right? And so um, as a result, you're actually going to get a net energy savings, right? So let's maybe kind of pause and kind of piece through that, right? Okay, so um, the amount of energy it takes for you to do an operation, right, is the time it takes times the average power it takes to do it. So as you turn down that voltage, it's going to take a longer amount of time, but that power reduction is going to be so great that it's going to outweigh it, right? You have a net reduction in energy, right? So this is kind of actually some of the original proponents of this kind of technique were actually like, you know, early 90s, like Ananta Trendakasan with his early parallelization work, showing, you know what, it's like a certain unit. If I instead were to run a unit at half the um, uh, performance rate, use a second unit, so now I have two of these units. <laughs> uh, because I have two units running at half performance, I still have performance conserved. It's going to require twice the area because I have these two units, right? However, uh, because of these voltage scaling tricks, you're actually going to save energy, right? So that's a pretty cool uh, discovery that's kind of been motivated a lot of us. So we're kind of going parallel, you know, in order to save energy. So this is a, you know, area energy trade-off, so to speak. Um, what's enabling that is kind of thinking about more about this notion that we can kind of, you know, set our voltage and frequency as we need to accordingly, right? So these are kind of um, two parameters we have to play with. Um, so with that in mind, there's kind of a few things we can do. Uh, one uh, is just, you know, statically setting our voltage and frequency to be uh, what it needs to be, right? We know for a certain performance target, we have this. If we can shorten a critical path, even though we're beating timing, if we can still shorten a critical path more, we can run an even lower voltage to save more power, that's great. Um, some people refer to this as crawl to deadline, right? Figuring out what your requirement is, what your performance target is, and just going just long enough to complete it just on time, right? There's no benefit turning in before deadline, so might as well just get it done right on time and save as power as long as you can. Um, we're going to see the exact opposite in the next slide. Um, in terms of uh, how this is applied in practice, uh, people using their devices tend to be very bursty, right? They tend to want to do things and then, you know, you're not going to do things anymore. Um, maybe you're running a very demanding application or then maybe you're running a less demanding application, right? And so uh, it's actually interesting and helpful to actually change your frequency and voltage dynamically, right? So sometimes referred to as DVFS for dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, right? So with DVFS, um, we are going to, uh, you know, set these accordingly, right? So, you know, for right now I need a high performance regime. I'm going to crank the voltage, crank the frequency and meet those. Uh, meanwhile, if I need a lower performance point, I'm going to crank the voltage and frequency down and reach a lower performance point. Realize and it's going to take less power to, to operate that point. Um, realize it's the same hardware, right? The same circuit has the same fundamental topology of gates. Uh, and if we were to do the analysis, the same FO4. It's just, as I said, we're, you know, when you think about your critical path or, you know, your delay, think of that in terms of picoseconds, then you think about that in terms of picoseconds at a certain voltage, right? So you kind of change these two together. Um, and there's a lot of research about how should, uh, you know, manufacturers optimally set the voltage and frequency relative to each other. Um, they often do that kind of empirically, or you have some sort of self-calibrating things in design. There's something called the canary circuit, which is a circuit you kind of can look at and see how long it takes to do certain things, and based on that, you can kind of automatically adjust these timing parameters. This is very standard in modern big chip designs, where they can dynamically set the voltage and frequency uh, in order to get a certain performance target. So you as a you know, person building uh, configurable generator blocks at the lowest level, this is kind of above you, but be aware that even if you're well be, uh, beyond the performance target, there's still additional benefit uh, to make your critical path shorter so someone else can slow you down with a lower voltage to save more energy. Uh, questions? Yeah. Okay. So then, um, interestingly, so we're talking about going slow, uh, there's a contrasting school of thought which is about going fast. <laughs> Uh, so uh, another way to save energy, remember energy is power times time. So the prior slide, well, let's turn down power. Uh, 
This other one that says, you know what? What if I just reduce time, <laughs> right? If I have, if I'm consuming power for less time, that's gonna take less power, right? So I sort of take, take less energy, right? So that that's great. Um, and so kind of what you do is you want to think about getting your operation done as quickly as you can, and um, that's just gonna save time. So sometimes you can kind of think about this in terms of a larger system where uh, you often need to do multiple things, right? So for example, imagine even on a smartphone, uh, you know, we might think of it as, oh, there's gaps between when the user hits a button or touches something. There's actually a lot of periods of burst and idleness, right? For example, say the user's watching a video. While they're watching that video, uh, you know, you need to, you know, we perceive, you know, it moving because the screen's updating, you know, 30, 60, 120 hertz, whatever it's doing. But realize, you know, even at 120 hertz, you know, order 100 hertz, that's, you know, only 100 times per second, right? Our circuits are running in the gigahertz machine, right? So that's, that's, that's you know, tens of millions of clock cycles per frame, right? That, that, that's actually quite a fair amount of time, right? So um, as a result, what you can do is you can work really hard to find or render whatever you need to do to produce the next frame. And after you finish that, you can go to sleep until the next frame. <laughs> And then do this whole process over again. Um, so let's race the halt, right? The idea is, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to sprint through the portion we need to get through, and then we are going to um, go to sleep to save power. So that's another way of doing it, right? And so uh, that seems a little bit like in kind of contrast philosophically to the crawl deadline. Just kind of crawl the deadline, race the halt. Um, turns out, and you look at the modern design. You're going to see both of these philosophies embedded throughout it, right? And so what's going on? Um, turns out they're both kind of right. You know, 10, 15 years ago, these are kind of competing research ideas. Uh, and it, they turned out, you know, it depends on the situation, which one makes sense, right? So uh, the crawl deadline uh, makes sense given a few uh, preconditions, right? One is, you know, this notion that we turn down our voltage uh, we get this super linear benefit in power reduction, right? Because if we turn our voltage down, we're going to get a reduction in performance. Um, and, but, you know, hopefully that's compensated for by an even bigger reduction in power. Um, so, uh, so what's, what makes it interesting is sometimes in practice for some of these transistors and circuits, uh, even though the, you know, model say we should be in a quadratic curve, um, if you're so low in a voltage regime, it's actually more linear. And then that may not get you that, you know, benefit uh, from going parallel to get um, the energy savings. In which case, even if you aren't going parallel to get energy savings, still going slower can save you some energy. Um, but the other key caveat is where the power comes from, right? So uh, that's CV squared F equation. That's kind of the dynamic power. But as I said, if you have the static power portion, the other things you kind of can't control are kind of always on. Um, what are it takes to make those reduced is what you're going to want to do, right? If that's really static, really uncontrollable, like there's this base platform power you can't turn off, then it's kind of a no-op. But if it's something you can control, that's where race to halt comes in. Because if you can go ahead and turn off that base platform power while you're halted, so to speak, and sleeping, then you get some additional savings. So it kind of depends on the situation which these make sense and which things you can kind of turn on or off. But as a designer, kind of in a big picture, what are you thinking about is uh, what things need to really be on? What can I turn off? How can I reduce my activity factors? Um, how can I reduce my area, right? Because reducing areas as I said before is gonna help you save power. And even how can I ensure my critical path? Even making, meeting my peak performance uh, goal, if I can ensure that critical path, I'm gonna make it much easier for me to turn on voltage and frequency uh, for other stuff. Okay, there's a lot here, but I'm gonna pause any more questions about uh, the power kind of considerations. Uh, okay, so then uh, let's change gears and talk about exploring a design space. So all quarter I've been telling you, yeah, let's build these generators. Yeah, we want to, you know, have a lot of parameters. Well, guess what? Uh, you have a lot of parameters in one component, and you put that in another component, you have a lot of parameters, and now you have the cross product. You have just tons of parameters, right? So pretty quickly you're going to be drowning in parameter options, right? And the question is, how do you go about exploring this design space, right? Because how do you choose which these parameters in which ways, right? Um, and understand that these uh, design spaces can be much bigger than just simply, you know, 
turning all the knobs of the generators I've built, right? It could be a choice of, you know, how am I even connecting together all these generators I've built? How am I approaching this problem? What algorithm am I even considering to solve this problem, right? So it can be a very big, broad thing, right? And so within this very big, broad thing, how do I go about picking the right design? Um, so in order to answer that question, you probably need to ask yourself, well, what metrics matter to me in this application scenario? Realize that those may change depending on you know, what you're doing. And um, as is often the case, you may find yourself optimizing for multiple metrics. How do you weigh those trade-offs, right? Because you're going for more than one metric. If I improve one with no expense of everyone else, obviously it's better. But if I have to improve one at the expense of the other, i.e. a trade-off, how do I weigh that trade-off? Right, so that's what we're kind of be talking about. Okay, so first, you know, let's talk a little about these metrics, right? So, uh, you know, PPA is first three ones we're pretty familiar with, right? You know, your power, performance, and area. Um, and so, yeah, we can remember that even though we say, oh, yeah, power is a single term, right? As we just discussed in the last few minutes, right? There's a lot of aspects to power, right? Um, there's your average power consumption, which is kind of set your efficiency, as well as your peak power consumption, which may also have different things, right? Especially if you have DVFS, right? Your, your peak and your average may be very different, right? And even if you don't have DVFS, your peak and average may be different because you're turned off portions. So some portions are pulling power, some portions are not pulling power. It's going to change your power consumption, et cetera. Um, even for something like, sounds innocuous, like performance. You say, oh, that's clear. Performance is a single term. Well, even performance, depending on your application scenario, maybe you care more about latency of a single task, or maybe you care about some sort of throughput or rate. And then when it comes to area, right, the other term, right, normally we're kind of thinking about, you know, chip resources, okay, how much dye are we taking up or how many LUTs on a FPGA, but realize sometimes other metrics may also matter, right, you know, how many IO pins do I need to get to the outside world, right, that can be an important metric to optimize, because, you know, when it comes to actually packaging up your chip, the number of pins in that package actually will have a strong uh, cost impact, right, or perhaps there's other components beyond your chip in the system, how many DRAM chips do I need or something, or other components that are going to impact your cost, so, uh, here I said area, but maybe I should have called that cost, but I chose to use it area because I want to keep that PPA so you guys use that uh, term. Um, and there's a lot of other things beyond PPA to consider, right? And some of these things maybe aren't easily quantified, but it doesn't mean there aren't things you shouldn't consider when you're exploring design space. Uh, so things like usability, right? You know, um, how practical is this thing to use for actual people to use to solve the problem they care about? Uh, I'm actually getting that portion done. Uh, is there security considerations I need to be worried about? Various side channels or things to be concerned about. Um, kind of pointing off that same cost theme. Uh, how manufacturable is it? Uh, is another thing to consider, right? You know, my blizzard is going to be, you know, required a perfect, lucky uh, alignment of things that happen in manufacturing, or is it going to be easy to make a bunch of these very robustly? Um, how testable is it, right? How easy for me to test the design at the end, as well as after it's been manufactured, can they double check this thing is ready to go out in the field? Um, or fault tolerance, and I'm sure there's other metrics I've forgotten, right? This is me just trying to be overly uh, eager, trying to think of things you might consider, right? So there's a lot of metrics. Somehow you got to kind of, you know, figure out, navigate those metrics and identify which of those metrics are um, ones you can turn into hard constraints, you know, like I must, uh, you know, satisfy a certain thing, versus which of these are ones I need to optimize. And it may turn out there's some metrics, you know, that are ones you really care about optimizing, there's some metrics that have hard constraints that like I can't have, you know, uh, a thing that costs more than X, I can't draw more than one watt or something. And then um, there will be other metrics you kind of, you can keep an eye on, maybe it's kind of more like a optimization target, it's maybe a, sec a secondary optimization target, you know, you can kind of keep an eye on it. Um, when it comes to the parameters, right, when you want to phrase this problem formally, you know, design exploration where you have, you know, the metrics you're trying to optimize for, which you know you're formally stating as ones you're optimizing for versus the ones that are constrained, uh, and you have these parameters going in, that's you know pretty clear, but sometimes as a human, um, like I said, think big on design space, right? Sometimes you know you may want to consider very different architectures or microarchitectures or approaches, algorithms, etc. Um, and so uh, with these generators, right, we have, we have makes it really easy to kind of consider a lot more parameters. Um, and when you think of the parameters, right, there's kind of two types of parameters. There's the ones that you're kind of, you know, in some ways user facing, and by user I mean people external to your module. And they're looking at, you know, how many ports, you know, these are things that have packed down, right? You know, how you're going to behave in an externally visible way, right? You know, how many ports do you have? Uh, what's the latency completing the operation? Uh, you know, other features about what you're doing. That's different than the ones that are internal, which 
will not change the externally visible um, behavior, but may impact uh, its efficiency, right? You know, how many units you have internally for parallelism, right? How much parallelism internals are in there, uh, various buffer, queue, field sizes, etc., memories. Um, as I said, the approach of your algorithm, or even topologies, expecting things internally, you're doing a tree, you're doing a linear reduction, these kinds of things, right? So there's gonna be a lot of parameters, okay? And so, like I said, you end up with just a very big problem, right? You have a zillion metrics, uh, a zillion parameters, how do you make sense of this, right? So you kind of need to tame design space. And so, uh, like I said, for the metrics, you want to think about which of these are ones that really matter for your usage scenario, or there some you can ignore, which would be ideal. Are there some that you, know, you really want to optimize, or is it one you can maybe just um, turn into a constraint, saying, you know what, uh, I would like to reduce um, my average power consumption, that's one if I want to optimize, but in terms of peak power, uh, I'm fine saying there's a constraint. I need to keep peak power below one watt, for example. Um, and then even amongst the remaining metrics, you may still have multiple metrics. Uh, there's kind of a question of, um, is there you know, some sort of precedence ordering maybe? Because you said, you're gonna need some way to uh, consider things that change multiple metrics simultaneously, right? Some design decisions you're gonna make may impact multiple metrics. And so sometimes maybe you have a strict precedence ordering, like I'm always doing whatever it takes to have the minimal area. I don't care about anything else, minimal area, I don't care if it you know, burns up, right? Minimal area. Fine, if that's easy, you can have your or constraints ordered, that's great. And you only consider the second constraint, or sorry, second metric, if the first metric is minimized, and there's a tie, great. But that's pretty rare. Usually you kind of have multiple metrics and you need to have trade-offs. Some folks might be tempted to make some sort of, you know, weighted equation, you know, weighing them all together in some sort of single unified heuristic. That's not really always practical, right? You're gonna sometimes really kind of want to understand how these things kind of play out and kind of play with these trade-offs, right? And then um, when it comes to making sense of the zillion parameters, right? Uh, there can be a lot, right? And so a little bit of analysis as a designer can help you, right? So for example, recognizing if some parameters are truly independent um, or there's some dependencies to kind of connections between them, right? Uh, additionally, maybe some parameters that you know that probably should be related, right? So for example, if I have a producer-consumer connection pattern, uh, I probably want to make sure that the producer throughput matches the consumer throughput, at least an average, right? Because if I have, you know, <clears throat> a producer that's producing at twice the rate the consumer can consume, then you know, the producer's gonna be throttled, you know, because it can't produce because the queue's full. Likewise, if the consumer can consume twice as fast as the producer's producing, that's just wasted capacity, right? So maybe there's some uh, parameters that actually you can know that are dependent and use a designer kind of this intuition, you can kind of help with that. Um, additionally, some parameters maybe you know that this is not gonna be a huge deal for someone you know are gonna be a huge deal. So maybe you can kind of, you know, get a sense of design space. So if you haven't already intuited this, um, this design space exploration process it actually is going to involve uh, human intervention. It's not something you can just kind of hand off the tools and let them solve it for you. There's decades of research trying to do that, but unfortunately, uh, some amount of human understanding of this problem and setting the problem upright, as well as uh, even navigating the space, is going to be required. Um, okay, so uh, when it comes down to uh, exploring the design space, right, um, it's really application dependent. Right? So I was saying in the beginning, we're kind of trying to make sense of what metrics we care about how we weigh about them, which ones we can turn into constraints, uh, then the parameters. If you try and make this very formal mathematical, this can turn and look like a non-convex optimization problem for which there is a lot of research and tools, but it's also known there's kind of limits to what can be done there. <laughs> um, and very quickly you may find that brute force may not be possible, right? So a complete exhaustive search of trying every possible thing um, is not really uh, doable, right? So if you only can explore a certain number of options, and the value of certain number of options, how do you choose those options to eventually hopefully get the best one? Um, so like I said, this typically involves some amount of human guidance. Now, sometimes uh, you kind of have a sense of how to tune things. You're like, you know what? I should set this parameter first. Let's get that parameter right. I can set this next parameter and then this next parameter. And you kind of like manually sweep the design space dimension by dimension. This actually is tractable for some small cases, right? You can kind of figure this out. Um, and in terms of actual more formal algorithms for doing this, you know, you have classic things like branch and bound and programming. Surprisingly, randomized search sometimes is not too bad. Uh, and then, of course, I'm kind of having this, this catch-all term of most, more sophisticated algorithms you can use. Uh, these are things like, you know, actually people are really excited about this, you know, 15 years ago, 
about like what they call genetic algorithms, right? Algorithms are trying to have evolution, selection, and criteria and kind of keep doing things. Of course, now we're going to say, oh, just throw machine learning, deep learning at this. And yeah, guess what? Uh, machine learning actually can do pretty well with some of these things and help kind of explore the science space somewhat, assuming it's set up in certain ways. Um, there's various tools to try and set this up. But I just want you to kind of be aware they exist, right? So there's a lot of attempts to automate the science space exploration with tools, but it's going to definitely require some of hand holding. And especially when you're using one of these tools, you definitely want to be aware of what it's doing and what it's not doing because if there's design points it's not considering, uh, you need to convince yourself it's okay, right? <laughs> uh, if they're comparable to your, what you're getting, you're probably going to lose too much sleep. But you know, if you have a very large design space and you're trusting a tool to explore that space for you, and there's some design points it's not considering that perhaps could be a lot better than what you're doing, that's a problem, right? So maybe you want to spend like you know, try and figure out what's the limit for how good you think you can do, and that's if you know, I think it's the best I can do, and that's considering the best I think is possible for this problem. Um, considering I have design points that are pretty close to that, I kind of rest easy, right? So um, yeah, this is definitely an interesting spot of research. I said there's decades of research in the architecture community, design community of people trying to automate the design space exploration process. Uh, and I will say, as in, you know, in practice, sometimes you can use PCs, tools, and places, but there's still a, few, a significant amount of human kind of involvement in this uh, process. Um, so when it comes to actually evaluating these design points, it's kind of a question of what to do. Uh, historically, people for science exploration often use models. So they do some sort of analytic equation written by a human, or maybe make some sort of behavioral model. Uh, the reason why is using a model is much cheaper to evaluate than uh, mod uh, evaluating a real thing. Now, what's nice is with our generators, it's actually really easy to make these other options, right? Um, and so that's actually a real strong strength of the generator approach is rather than saying, I hope my model kind of captures this trade-off and I want to get the model, use the model in the beginning to do design space consideration in the beginning, determine the right sizes, parallelisms, et cetera, and then go build a single instance that's exactly those parameters and hope they were right, hope the model can do the right thing. Instead what I can do is I can make a generator, parameterize these things, and then actually try them out and then convince myself, yes, for this generator, these actually are the right parameters. That's great. I can I can now try that out. Uh, additionally, uh, doing design space exploration in advance sometimes can be helpful, but it's also kind of maybe be a little misleading, right? Like I said, maybe you're trusting your models are right, but if your models aren't right, it's kind of hard to do. So this is kind of yet another example of where this agile process of you know get started, get things working, but also evaluate and kind of continuously revise and iterate is going to help you, right? Where rather than trying to perfectly forecast everything you're going to need, uh, get your hands dirty, see what things are going to cost, see what performances you're achieving, what areas, energies, etc., and then kind of make that uh, trade off accordingly, right? Um, so I would, I would argue this is kind of almost like the, the biggest reason why I want Agile is when it comes down to actually fine tuning your design to meet the needs of the application scenario. It's really hard to advance, right? Remember that um, a lot of these things are impacted, for example, by which technology you use to implement things and the nature in which you chose to implement these things, how you chose to design these little buffers and stuff. And so if you're able to kind of see this whole big picture and see, okay, well, here's what my energy consumption is today, here's my area consumption today, here's my performance for today, and see where it is relative to your targets and kind of keep adjusting that, you're going to kind of be able to explore design space much more intelligently and, both, and optimize more intelligently than you were trying to get this all perfectly right in advance, right? It's, it's almost inimaginable to kind of imagine getting this right in advance sometimes, especially with something that's kind of more novel and new. If it's something that's very incremental, like, you know, you're making tweaks to this year's process, processor relative to last year's processor, you maybe can make really good models for that, and people do, but if you're making something completely scratch, like a new hardware component to do a new kind of application, maybe it's not easy to make those models in advance and validate those models, in which case this agile approach of being able to kind of get the things running and actually measure it will help. Okay, uh, questions on this. Okay, and then, um, so to wrap up, I want to introduce this concept of a Pareto frontier, which is kind of a, a way to um, uh, really nicely uh, think about these, um, these trade-offs, right? So you're hearing me use this term Pareto, and so what are we talking about? Well, it's Pareto optimal and Pareto frontier. Right, so a Pareto optimal point means in this, you know, large space I'm considering, uh, there's no point that's going to be better on all metrics, right? In other words, that if I'm going to improve one metric, it's going to come to the expense of something else. And you're going to see examples in the next slide. And then the Pareto frontier are the surface of points that um, trace this out. And so a kind of trade-off kind of gets manifested 
uh, as this frontier. So uh, I've chosen two figures from the research literature, which are really wonderfully uh, kind of capture uh, these Pareto trade-offs. So here's one, oops, maybe I'll uh, briefly make this a little smaller so it fits better. Give me a moment. Uh, where is the number? Let's make that 80. Boom, okay, it fits a lot better. Oops, I cut off the uh, citation. Uh, this is from Sophia Shaw's Aladdin paper, which is a fantastic paper. And what they did in this research was they were designing a matrix multiply unit. Theirs was pretty sophisticated, a little more sophisticated than what we did in the homework. And they had a lot of knobs to play with. And so uh, what they were considering, as you can see here, is just a lot of design points. You know, how big to make various structures, uh, how certain bandwidths, etc. And what you see is this kind of curve that occurs a lot in these parade optimal plots is this nice uh, curve here, right? And so what does this curve correspond to? Well, uh, you know, power is on the y-axis, times on the x-axis. So for both of these metrics, lower is better. That's not always a requirement for these parade optimal curves. That's just, you know, the way it was set up in this case. And so, yeah, so, you know, if you are down or to the left, that's better, right? So for example, if I were to compare you know, this point to this point, that point achieves the same performance for less power, right? So I would rather be that yellow point than this orange point, right? Um, however, if you compare this yellow point to, for example, uh, some of these points over here, you'll see that, wait, for the same power, I can get lower performance, right? That, sorry, lower, lower time, which is higher performance, right? That's good, you, you'd rather be over here. You would, don't wanna be over here, right? Um, and so as a result, uh, what you really want to be, depending on your application, you may have a certain performance or power target, but you want to be on this frontier, right? So this frontier, these, these points on the boundary here, these are the Pareto frontier, right? So if you're somewhere over here, uh, it's possible if you were better at designing and chose different parameters, you could both go faster and use less power, right? You don't want to be in that situation. But if you're on that frontier, if someone wants to improve one of those metrics, it has to come at the expense of the other. And this also kind of shows the reason why you want to have a design space exploration, right? Because if you're just a single one of these points, you're kind of missing out on the entire realm of possibilities. Now, in the case of the context where this work came from, this was one of these tools which, uh, you know, did the um, analysis using models, to try and get a very quick, they were able to kind of, by using a model, they reduced the cost of value design points, they were able to kind of do a very large space, design space very quickly. Uh, but, you know, the utilities approach, it kind of depends on what's going to happen. Now, meanwhile, uh, having a generator is going to help you kind of tee through this better, but you can still see here, there's a lot of different trade-offs, right? And uh, for given, you know, here's, we're trying to tease a lot of different dimensions, so they kind of have some things kind of conveyed, but you can kind of see that as you kind of increase certain things, uh, you know, as for example, increasing L1 bandwidth for level one, they're blocking hierarchy, right? Okay, you're really to bring a lot more power, but yeah, you also really, um, save a lot of execution time. And you also see it's a common thing in these Pareto curves. This is not a requirement, it seems to work out like some practice a lot. You get this kind of um, saturation effects, right? Where to go uh, just a little bit faster, like from here to here, it's not a huge change in performance, right? In absolute terms. But, oh my gosh, you'd like double your power, right? However, you know, in this regime, you're kind of in, in the knee of the curve, right? Um, it's kind of a nice sweet spot. Meanwhile, you know, if you're like way over here, right? And I want to uh, save power. For the same right here, I want to save power. For just a little bit of power saving, I take a huge performance hit, right? So, you know, for you, perhaps you usually want to be, be this need to curve, you kind of have a much more impact and you kind of a nice point, but sometimes you don't want to be there. Sometimes, you know, I have a certain performance target, power target, and I need to go to that point. But you do want to be on the creative frontier, right? That's kind of the point. Um, cool. I have one more of these plots. Maybe I'll pause and make questions on this one first about this concept. Yeah, yeah, so the question from Ch uh, was, was asking about, you know, how do I know where I want to be? Is there some optimal point? Um, as, as I said before, yeah, you definitely want to be on the frontier. And when you're on the frontier, you kind of, you know, maximally exploiting that trade-off. In terms of a single optimal point, 
you're going to need to uh, define that, right? Uh, because there's this kind of concept of Pareto optimality, meaning that if I have multiple metrics, uh, a point is Pareto optimal if I can't improve all of them, right? But there may be another point which is also Pareto optimal, which improves one of those metrics. So how do I choose point A versus point B? That's going to be kind of how you formulate the problem in your context, right? So maybe you have a strict presence ordering in your metrics. You say, you know what? I care about all metrics, but I care about this metric more. And so every point has the best perform, uh, you know, on that metric, that's the one that's optimal. Or as I said, sometimes people are able to kind of, you know, turn this into a, a um, way of weighting things where they, you know, make a heuristic equation, which is, you know, weights times each metric and then add those up. Now it's kind of collapsed into uh, a single metric. Then you can say it's optimal. But kind of this whole concept of Pareto optimality is kind of saying, you know what, that if I'm trying to optimize multiple metrics, uh, you know, there may be multiple optimal points, right? And so, yeah, uh, in terms of the designer, navigating that space is kind of um, really application dependent, but it's the key point is when you navigate that space, you want to be on that trade-off, you want to be on that trade-off frontier is kind of the key idea. I don't know, maybe that, that gets to your question. I maybe didn't quite answer it. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of an issue where it's like, there's multiple metrics, right? So how do you weigh multiple metrics? Um, yeah, yeah. So the other question is, which is a great observation, was you know, yeah, it seems like it was really diminishing returns when you go really far in both directions. So that that need occurs is very tempting. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, and um, this is why it's nice to have these kind of plots as a designer. Is you know, I said there may be some metrics which are on your radar as like your top criteria, but as you get a sense for what it costs to get certain changes, you can kind of can, uh, as a human in the loop, decide how you want to play with these trade-offs, right? And so these trade-off frontiers are a great way to visualize this. Uh, design exploration, of course, gives you those data points to work with. Um, but yes, uh, you know, you may decide, you know what, from application, uh, I really want to minimize power and I can just, you know, get away of taking forever. In which case, I'll just keep going, going, and going. I'll, I am willing to pay that exorbitant price. Um, but it's a trade-off. And so uh, another similar Pareto kind of plot like this is an interesting one. This is from an architecture paper. And in this one, what they're doing is looking at different uh, microarchitectural designs. So they're comparing uh, in-order cores and out-order cores. And they're comparing the issue width, right? So how superscalar or not superscalar they are. And so I, I chose this plot for multiple reasons, right? Um, number one, you can see for a given design, Let's say this one. This one's the solid line in black with the round circles. That is an out of order chord, it's one issue. You see that if you look at its energy, so lower is better. In this case, they inverted performance. So rather than being execution time to the left, performance to the right, you know, it's better to the right, you know, high performance more instructions per second is better. You see that given core actually has a traces out a range of uh, points, right? And so you can see that they, they basically are doing DVFS on this core. It may actually it may not be dynamic, maybe static, but they're voltage and frequency scaling this core, and so they can you know change its performance. And you guess what? At lower performance points, they actually are taking less energy. This isn't power; it's energy. So it's actually more energy efficient as it's going slower. And see the same thing for this core, right? You know, at a certain point, I, you know, I'm spending a little more on energy and getting a nice improvement in, in performance. This need a curve. Wow, it's really impactful. I can really trade off energy and performance pretty directly. And then, you know, beyond this point, oof, I'm paying a lot of power to get just a little bit more performance, right? So you can see that for any one of these points, kind of thing, this, this often happens where you'll set, think of things kind of as voltage and frequency is more mutable. You have this op op opportunity. But it, additionally, you can see that uh, because each of one of these, you know, designs, as you kind of explore design space, in this case, the parameter for design isn't just the architecture, it's the voltage and frequency it's operating at. Um, they kind of overlap, right? You can see that depending on, if you trace the underside of this curve, that's the Pareto frontier, you'll see that different processor architectures actually went out in different cases, right? So for super low power applications, which have the lowest performance, or say for low performance applications, to get the lowest energy, uh, the most efficiency, you're gonna want the in order in one, one issue, right? That makes sense, right? Guess what? You get a little bit more performance uh, by using the uh, two wide. and it, Pretty energy efficient, right? So you see, for example, that one wide, right, is not a line, right? Beyond a certain point, it really blew up energy-wise. Actually, you're better off with the two wide, 
two wides the squares, right? And why is two wide not as good? Well, for really low performance points, uh, that one wide is going to be less energy, right? So you can kind of see this kind of trade off, right? So this, this is another kind of kind of situation where you kind of see that once again, there's this frontier where you want to be on the frontier, right? You want to have something where you know you can't improve both all metrics simultaneously. Um, and realize you may, you know, be on that frontier like here or not, <laughs> depending on the, the regime you're in, right? Um, and so this is another example of kind of a creative frontier kind of trade-off situation. It's a great place to stop. I'll take any uh, concluding questions. Okay. Um, with that, uh, have a good weekend, folks.